Good evening, guys, and thanks for coming back again. And uh, Pastor Weaver, I've learned a lot from you, too. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. How are you guys doing this evening? You ready for the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan like you've never heard it before? Yeah, me too. All right, well, in the previous hour, we were meeting with folks who were interested in uh, going to um, the land of Israel and studying the Bible in context with us. But if you had some other, some previous engagement just because you weren't here, that doesn't preclude your involvement. All you've got to do is see some friends and get them to fill you in. And we've got a website. You can take a look at uh, what the, uh, at what the uh, trip looks like and uh, there's all kinds of helps, uh, frequently asked questions, and all sorts of stuff like that. See pastors, and uh, they, can, they can help fill you in. So don't feel like you were excluded at all. So uh, in this um, flight module that you saw earlier this morning, uh, we are going to use that again just to sort of set the, the stage for this, and then I'm going to migrate to a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, all right? So... Where you are right now, you notice the Dead Sea in the background, true? So the Mediterranean is back here, it's somewhere in the choir loft, right? Okay, we'll just use our imagination, sanctified imaginations. You can see uh, the lower Jordan River channel as it flows into the Dead Sea. You can see Jericho here, right? It's kind of an oasis. In between Jericho and Jerusalem is the Judean wilderness, which is very dry and barren because it's in a rain shadow. The rain falls in the highlands. Jerusalem is not on a windswept plain like you see in all of the Hollyweird movies that you've ever seen with the tumbleweeds going by. That's a great um, kind of context for a western, you know, maybe a Clint Eastwood, you know, so like High Plains Drifter or something like this. It's not the land of Israel. Jerusalem is 2,800 plus feet above sea level, all right? And so it, here you have Jerusalem in the foreground and that's on a ridge that runs north-south and because cool air rises and that causes condensation the rain falls here in the highlands and then falls off to about 10 to 12 inches a year in the Judean wilderness by wilderness we don't mean wilderness like Daniel Boone wilderness we mean um, uninhabited areas that are uncultivatable because it doesn't get enough r annual rainfall so this is a, an area where no one lives. It's very deeply eroded because the soil is poor and the, what rain does fall in the highlands comes rushing down here in torrents. I mean, you know, like flash floods and eventually dumps into the Jordan River or the Dead Sea. All right, so that said, you have a blue line and a red line. Not sure if you can see it. You can just nod your head yes or no. But I'm going to basically track with that road. The blue one is the Old Testament road. The red one is the Roman period or New Testament road. And it basically follows the same trajectory from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And that's the way basically that you've got to go if you're going to travel from Jerusalem to Jericho or Jericho to Jerusalem. It's an old Roman road. You, there, on that road, you can still see the Roman carved steps so that chariots are able to move up and down without slipping. Uh, very, very cool place uh, to be and, and study Bible stuff. This wilderness, this is where you get in Psalm 63 verse 1, a psalm when David was hiding in the wilderness of Judah from King Saul. This is where you get in Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 that John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea preaching a gospel of repentance, a, a message of repentance and um, all of Jerusalem was coming out to him. So this is the context of a, a number of Bible passages like that. Now I'm going to get away from this and we're going to go to our uh, PowerPoint for tonight. All right. The question that we're presenting uh, to you tonight is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? I've got a hint for you. It's not this guy and it's not this song. What we're going to be looking at is the parable of the Good Samaritan. You'll find it in your Bibles in Luke chapter 10. And what I'd like to do, if you're able, are you able to see that and read it? 
If not, you can cheat and look at your Bible in your lap or on your phone. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What's written in the law? This is a pastor was addressing this earlier. Jesus is constantly quoting and directing other people to his Bible, the Hebrew Bible or what we call the Old Testament. What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he, the lawyer, answered, answered and said, and this is an interesting little uh, piece of evidence. It's almost like archaeology inside of literature. It's telling us that this this story was not originally given in Greek, although we have the Gospel of Matthew in Greek. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't transmitted in Greek, but rather it was said and then later transmitted orally in the Hebrew language because the phrase answered and said is not common in Greek literature. In fact, it never shows up and it's not common in Aramaic either. It is very common in Hebrew, and you find it all over the place in Jesus' Bible, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And he answered and said, and then he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind. And then this guy says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, a quote of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. So, these are the two passages that the great Rabbi Hillel in the previous generation had identified as encapsulating the spirit of the entire Law of Moses. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. A guy came to Hillel the Elder and he said, Master, I want you to teach me the whole Torah while I stand here on one foot. Hillel said, that's easy. Love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else is commentary. Now go and learn that too. So he kind of got a twofer there. Love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Okay, so it's kind of like, all right, I know the law, but how far does it extend? Who's, in, who's included in this neighbor thing that we're hearing about in Leviticus 19, 18? By the way, the book of Leviticus is totally irrelevant to Christians today, right? Wrong. Well, it's just all about priestly duties and sacrifices and holy calendar that we don't really follow and stuff like that. Yeah, no, but it also has this passage love your neighbor as yourself and we still quote that today where's that from Leviticus 19 18 so evidently it is relevant for us today Jesus quoted it this guy quotes it it's being talked about all over the place in the New Testament so first century Christianity certainly embraced this as a part of their Bible and understood it as being God's Word and still relevant to them. And they are the immediate disciples of Jesus of Nazareth. We stand in line with them, right? We're their spiritual descendants. Jesus replied and said, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, There it is again. That Hebrew, not Greek, not Aramaic, that Hebrew phrase that you find all over the place in the, fill in the blank, Old, Old, Old Testament, thank you very much, Old Testament. Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers. They stripped him, beat him, left him half dead. By chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, came to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Next day, he took out two denarii. A denarius is a big Roman coin that was a day's labor worth. Uh, we would say, what, 30, 50, whatever a day's labor is. I guess it depends on what your, uh, what your minimum wage is in your certain area. Let's just say Seattle or Portland, 15 bucks an hour. 
multiply that times eight, you got the worth of a denarius. Okay, maybe not then. Didn't seem to go over very well. You guys all small business owners? Which of these three do you think proved to be neighbor to the man who fell uh, uh, in, uh, uh, into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Not the priest, not the Levite, the Samaritan. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Now, let's break it down. The first, the first quote given by the man in response to Jesus' question, what does the law read? Who is my neighbor? What is the law? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And this guy responds, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. I've just put the Hebrew up here. I'm not asking you to memorize it. I'm asking you to look at the yellow. And I'm asking you just simply take a mental picture of this. I know you don't know the letters and you don't know the vowel points, but just take a look at it. Take a mental picture of this because it's going to come back to your good. It'll accrue to your good. The, the Hebrew reads, Ve'ahavta, and you shall love. All right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. The second commandment the guy quotes is from Leviticus 19, 18. I want you to notice this. Did you see that before? That yellow, okay? We'll show it to you again real quick, and then we're going to take it away. It's kind of like an eye test. Does it look the same? I'll do it again. It's the same word. It's the same phrase and you shall love. Okay, but yeah, you could pick, you could plop your finger down on just about any page of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, and you could find that same phrase. Survey says, no, it's not true. It only shows up three times in the whole Hebrew Bible, and this guy has put his finger, or fingers, on two out of the three. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Some kind of way in the tradition, probably going back to Hillel, they're, they, they're playing this Hebrew game. It's called Hekesh. We call it Scripture interpret Scripture, or comparing like with like. Love the Lord your God your, with all of your heart, soul, and strength. And uh, uh, the average person is going to go, okay, well, love is an action verb in Hebrew, the root ahav. You express love. You demonstrate. You show love. You don't emote love. It's not about the, you know, the short hair on the, back of your, uh, on the back of your back standing straight up. It's not simply an emotion. It's not romantic love in the sense of, you know, like the soap operas and stuff. It's not that. When the Bible talks about love, it is demonstrated, tangible, observable actions of love. Somebody needs your help. You help them. That is a demonstrable act of love. Get what I'm saying here? All right. So this guy has put his finger on a real question. How do you show tangible acts of love to a God who doesn't need anything? You know, he, he never loses his ratchet socket and needs to borrow yours. He's never out of town on vacation, so you don't have to go over and cut his grass for him or get his mail. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it, this is a God who simply doesn't need anything from us. It says in, I believe, Acts 17, not that he is in need of anything from us, but it's in him that we live and move and have our being. He doesn't need us. You may have heard this it, stuff that's said on Christian TV or in Christian, you know, uh, devotional books and stuff like that. God created human beings because he needed somebody to praise him. I got news for you. If we weren't around to do the praising, the rocks would be praising. The, the psalmist says the heavens declare the glories of God. So he doesn't need a, oh well, he, he needed human beings because he needed to have fellowship. Look, he's got all the angels in heaven. It's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they're always cooperating with one another. He didn't need fellowship with us. Oh, well, he needed us because he needed us to be able to evangelize the world. This God is so big that you serve, he could have used aardvarks to get his message across and could have done it very well. In fact, they'd have probably been more obedient than we are most of the time turtles or doves or something like he could have used anything but he chose to use us to involve us in his work of reconciling the world to himself how cool is that isn't that neat 
So he doesn't need anything from us. So how do you show love to a God who doesn't need anything from us? Evidently, this is the way that the rabbis were doing it in Jesus' day. He said, it, you'll show your love for me by loving others created in my own image and after my own likeness. And that's where you get this ve'ahavta, love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, and ve'ahavta, love your neighbor as yourself. If it's the same word in one place and the same word in another place, you use the clear to explain or to better understand the unclear. It's called hekesh in Hebrew. We call it scripture interpret scripture. You've heard that before, right? It's just usually not explained in our circles. It's like we're supposed to be born with a knowledge of what does that phrase mean? What does that principle of Bible interpretation mean? Scripture interprets scripture. It's simply you interpret the unclear on the basis of the clear. But there's got to be some point of commonality. Got to use the same kind of language. It's got to be addressing the same issue. It's got to be developing the same theme, right? And so this guy has found, yes, the verbs match perfectly. Ve'ahavta, ve'ahavta. And you shall love God and you shall love neighbor. Now we go with this. Jesus, he says, yeah, but who is my neighbor? Yeah, but who is my neighbor? Remember, he's got two of the three ve'ahavtas already nailed down. Love God, love neighbor. Now the question comes, yeah, but who is neighbor? Jesus replied and said, and this is what Jesus does. Instead of giving him the third ve'ahavta, he tells him a story. Well, that's pretty rabbinic. That's pretty standard. For 200 years, for 200 years, rabbis have been teaching people using parables. I want to teach you just a little bit about parable for a second. Is it fair? Okay. We have more than 2,000 parables from the early rabbis, not counting the 42 or 47 or how many ever you count of Jesus. Okay, so we've got 40-something parables from Jesus. We have more than 2,000 from the early rabbis. So we've got lots of stuff to use compa to, to compare with. Lots of material to work with. The rabbis that teach parables, and by the way, only rabbis teach parables. The rabbis that teach parables are only from the land of Israel. There aren't rabbis in Italy. There aren't rabbis in Greece. There aren't rabbis in what we call today modern Turkey. There are some people that are called Rav, kind of like rabbi in Babylon, but they're all Jewish too. But the Jews in Babylon, the religious leaders, the people that they would call Rav or almost like rabbi, they don't tell parables. The only people who tell parables are rabbis in the land of Israel in the second century BC, second century AD, and now up to Jesus' time, first century AD. Yeah? First century BC, first century, uh, uh, second century BC, first century BC, and first century AD. This is the time period. It's in the land of Israel. It's only among Jewish people and only the leaders of the Pharisees, the rabbis, are telling parables. That tells you a little bit, actually it tells you quite a bit about Jesus, about how he functioned. He had disciples, he interpreted like a rabbi, he quoted the Bible like a rabbi, he told parables like a rabbi, he dressed like a rabbi. That's the reason the New Testament calls him so often Rabbi Jesus. Rabbi, master, it's translated sometimes differently. But the word behind all of that is Rabbi, my master, my great one. So Jesus decides he's instead of Quoting the third, Ve'ahavtah, he's going to tell him a parable. Does that put parable in context now? All right, good. Ah, one last thing on parable. Super important. I almost missed the main ingredient. Anybody remember Rodney Dangerfield of blessed memory? Okay, no. All right. Here's the thing. Parables function in this way. They are a snapshot of everyday life torn, ripped out of the pages of common everyday living and used by a rabbi to illustrate some kind of spiritual reality, some kind of heavenly reality, something that may be just a little bit beyond the grasp of the average person if you left it in the theoretical so the rabbis wouldn't and Jesus wouldn't either. 
You take something that is so standard, so normal, so stereotypical, we can use that kind of language, so everyday, and you rip that out of the pages of everyday life and you say, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what God is like. This is what life in the kingdom is like. This is what the life of an obedient servant is like. Okay? So, parable is illustrative. It's intended to illustrate. And that's the way that Jesus is functioning in his parable telling right here and right now. So, the question is, what is he illustrating? Well, he's answering the question, who is, come on, my neighbor? Exactly. So, Jesus replied or answered and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You may have heard this preached. You may have heard this taught. You may have read this and just kind of thought through it, and you've some kind of way gotten this cultural overlay. All right, there's this guy, this priest who lives in Jericho, and he's going to the temple to serve in the temple. And so he can't afford to touch the guy's left half dead. The priest, Levite after him, they don't know whether he's dead or not or whether he might be just about to die as he's touching him or trying to administer first aid. And if a priest, a Levite, comes into contact, any Israelite really, comes into contact with a corpse, then they are immediately rendered ritually impure. That's the law of Moses. All right, so if he's doing first aid or if he touches the guy to turn him over, he finds out he's dead, well, he can't go to work. Can't go to the temple, he's impure. He's got to sit out for a period of days, go through a, a, a process of ritual purification, and then eventually become purified just about when it's time for him to go home. Well, the problem with that is that this priest, according to Jesus, is going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Did you read that in your Bible there? A certain priest was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So what Jesus has just told us is this interpretation that we have heard for years and years and years is impossible. It doesn't work because the priest has already been to work, done his priestly course of two weeks, and he's now going home. He's not going to work. He's going from work. That's the reason that Jesus tells it this way. The guy has no excuse. If Jesus had left it ambiguous, you could have read that in. Or if Jesus had, uh, had reversed the order, reversed the flow of, of travel, then yeah, the guy would have been left with an excuse. Look, I have a greater responsibility. I can't just be bothered with serving one person. I've got to be serving the whole nation. But Jesus says a certain priest went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and, and passed the the man by who had been beaten by thieves and left half dead, right? So he has no excuse, and that's an important component in the parable. Notice Jerusalem, 2,800 feet above plus feet above sea level. Jericho, 850 feet below sea level. So he's going down to the tune of, of about 3,500 feet in just a matter of 14 miles. Very interesting. Very steep road. And you'll have an opportunity to experience it yourself. We won't be walking it like these guys did, but you will hear the gears grinding. You will uh, you feel the, the brake being applied uh, to the, to the, uh, on the bus that you're riding. All right, here's Jerusalem. You can see that the contour of the land, here's the Mount of Olives but behind it, to the east of it. You have the Kidron Valley in the shadow. And then behind the Mount of Olives is the Judean wilderness. And it continues to go down, 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 down to the tune of 3,500 feet loss of altitude in 14 miles. And eventually you find yourself down in the Jordan Valley at the city of Jericho. Here's another look at the same. The Judean wilderness. You see the Jerusalem Jericho Road right here? Another perspective of the Judean wilderness, you have these really deep gorges. There is one called Wadi Kelt, and this is the place that the Jerusalem-Jericho Road follows right along its edge. 
all the way down. Impossible to get lost. Don't need a GPS. You just, if you're going from Jerusalem to Jericho, you keep Wadi Kilt on your left and don't fall in it. Okay, now we're still in the Judean wilderness and look at this cut in the wilderness and you can see the oasis of Jericho in the plain below. Everybody got it? You're almost there. But digital doesn't hold a candle to actually being there. Somebody help me who's been on a previous trip. Thank you very much. All right, stage two. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. What's the operative term right here? Is this guy going from Jericho to Jerusalem or from Jerusalem to Jericho? Is he going up or is he going down? Is he going from work or to work in the temple? Likewise, there it is. There's the phrase, likewise. So in the text is the clue to the interpretation of that text. In the same way that the priest went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, so also the Levite <coughs> is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So he, like the priest, does not have an excuse for passing by this person who was in need. But a certain Samaritan, now this guy is not a priest, and he's not a Levite, and he's not even Jewish. In fact, if you read the Gospels, you hear all kinds of stuff about Samaritans. Jesus is going through Samaria, and there was a village that wouldn't receive them, wouldn't accept them. You Jews, just take your mess and keep on going down the road. We don't want anything you're selling. And John and James come to Jesus and say, Master, do you want us to bid fire to come down from heaven like the prophet Elijah did and consume them? Sounds like a whole lot of love going on right there to me. No. Remember Jesus when he, was, he healed the ten lepers? They went off and as they were going, they were cleansed of their leprosy. And so one of them came back to give thanks to God. And, and Jesus said, weren't there ten lepers that were cleansed? Yeah, there were, there, were, there were ten lepers that were cleansed. Well, why is it that the only one who came back was this foreigner? Because he was a Samaritan. Read that? Know about that? In the writings of Josephus and in the rabbis, you hear about all kinds of events taking place. Tit for tat. Uh, animosity between the Jewish community and the Samaritan community that was sandwiched between Jewish Galilee and Jewish Judea. Samaria in between. Example. One time when the Samaritans figured out that the Jews had... Um, come up with a system of bonfires to let people know, hey, it's time to start counting the 14 days of the month of Nisan, and then you observe Passover. Then they got their own bonfires put up, set up, and got the bonfire system started early and confused all of Judaism. That's according to Josephus and the rabbis. One time Samaritans broke into the temple in Jerusalem. I guess the guards were asleep and they had gunny, guinea sacks full of human bones and they spread them all over the temple courts and defiled the temple so that sacrifice and forgiveness and, and, and worship couldn't take place in the days following until ritual purification could take place. Well, the Jews were very happy to return the favor. There was one guy named John Hyrcanus, one of the middle Maccabean kings. It was a period of 100 years of Jewish independence between Greek rule and Roman rule. And one of these Jewish leaders went up to Samaria, conquered Samaria, and destroyed the Samaritan temple. Okay? Like blowing up their church. Well, we'll show you how we roll. So that you've got this going back and forth, always this, I, I call it an ever-increasing spiral of hatred between these two people groups because they were different ethnically and they were different religiously and they did not like each other and that's putting it mildly. So there was a Samaritan that came down. At this point in the story, if you read parables that were told by the early rabbis, you hear about a, a priest and you hear about a Levite and then the guy who comes along on the white horse. The guy who is the, he, he is the savior of the day. He's come on his white horse 
to fix the problem, to drive off the enemy, to deliver the damsel in distress, and to fix everything that's broken. Guess who he is? He's a rabbi. He's a leader of the Pharisaic movement. But what Jesus has just done is turn the tables on everything and he has a surprise ending to his parable. This is the shock value. This is irony. This is Jesus grabbing everybody by the throat and going, listen to this, something different's going on here. Surprise ending. Isn't that great? Don't you love it when a movie ends up in such a way that it's not so predictable that it's, yeah, I could have written that script myself. This is, what, this, is the, this is the genius of Jesus as a master teacher. Now he's got this guy's attention. Because this guy's thinking, yeah, the priest, yeah, the Levite. Next guy comes along, he's going to be the rabbi. We can all stand up and cheer. And everybody goes home happy because we knew the ending from the very beginning. And Jesus turns the tables on him. But a certain Samaritan was on a journey. He came and he felt compassion for the guy. And he put him, bandaged his wounds up and put him on his own beast, took him to an inn paid for his uh, overnight stay and said he's going to come by and pay the rest of the balance if need be. And he is the hero of the story. Now Jesus says, now which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? I want you to listen carefully to what this guy says because all of this is very carefully worded. I think you've picked up on that already, right? A certain man went down from Jerusalem and a pre likewise a priest and likewise a Levite went down and that sort of thing. These the Ahavtas, you've learned that this is very nuanced literature. It, you, you've got to be reading this stuff with both eyes wide open, all right? So, which one of these proved to be a neighbor? I want you to listen to what this guy says. Listen carefully. Listen to what he doesn't say as well. And the man said, the one who showed mercy toward him. It's really clear in the parable. There's a priest, there's a Levite, and there's a, come on, help me here, Samaritan, all right? When the guy answers Jesus' question, which one proved neighbor? Which one of them acted like a neighbor? Which one actually showed the sort of love that the scriptures are, are telling us, commanding us, that we're supposed to demonstrate toward neighbor? He won't even say the word, um, you got it, didn't you? You did get it. This is not that hard. If this redneck can do it, anybody can do it, okay? This is, for, this is a Bible for everybody. But sometimes it just takes a little bit of um, elbow grease, a little bit of attention, a little bit of sensitization. And then you take what we do here. This is equipping, right? This is not a pablum feeding station. We're learning tools here. You can go and you can do this in your Bible. Do try this at home. He said, the one who showed mercy toward him. This is what Jesus says then you go and you do the same. Do it just like this guy did it. Who's the hero of Jesus' story? The... What is Jesus telling this guy to do? Go home and take your cues from a... Samaritan. Now again, I'm going to ask you the question, what is the reason that in answer to the man's question, who is my neighbor? Why is it that Jesus tells a parable? Why does Jesus tell this parable? Because Jesus has just given the guy, and this guy knows this Bible passage. He is a, quote, lawyer. That means that he's not a rabbi, but he's, and he's not exactly a scribe, but he's an expert in Jewish law. It's not a guy that has the jury curls, you know, the big, long, white, you know, in the flowing robes and stands, uh, sits b behind a, a big wooden bench in a courtroom. This is a guy who is an expert in Jewish law. He knows his Bible. Remember, he's already given you the two most important commandments that encapsulate the whole. So this guy is not, you know, a Johnny-come-lately. He's not uninitiated to the world of Judaism. He knows this word. So when Jesus tells this story about a Samaritan who is one who is, is actually the example, he's the one that the role model that the guy is supposed to 
to follow, he's hinted at the third and the last. There's only three of them in the whole Hebrew Bible. Do you remember when I asked you to take a mental snapshot of, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength? Do you remember when I asked you to take another snapshot now of, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself? I want you to look at these Bible references here, Leviticus 19.18 and Leviticus 19.34. You see those? They're just a few passages removed one from the other. In the same book, by the same author, Moses, Leviticus, in the same chapter, chapter 19, just a few verses later, after this, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, it says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34, ve'ahavta, and you know enough Hebrew now, you know that that's the same form as the one above it and the one above it. These are the three, and these three only. Jesus just told a parable that led this man up to this third ve'ahavta, this, and, this third and you shall love. It's in the same book, same chapter, just a few verses later, and it is, and you, and I've translated this literally, uh, it's right below it, and you shall do love, not feel love. That's not Hebrew, it's not even good Greek either. You shall do, perform visible, tangible expressions of acts of love toward people who are in need, and you shall do love to him. Now who is the him? You've got to look elsewhere, right around the same passage, and it's the ger, translated the stranger, the alien, the non-Jew, the person not like you, the person that you might, if you had your own choice about it, choose to not even like. You shall love the stranger like you love you or yourself. There's the third ve'ahavta. Jesus didn't even bother quoting the passage. He could have done that, and then we would have been ripped off of a really cool parable. I'm glad he didn't do that, aren't you? But what he did with this parable was that he put the illustration in front of the Bible verse that it was supposed to illustrate. He was leading this guy to water and encouraging him now to drink. What he's saying is, here's this parable about a guy who behaves like neighbor. And guess who he was? He was a ger. He was a stranger. He was an alien. He was a non-Jew. He was somebody that you aren't like and that you don't like. All things being equal, you may as well just say that they hated each other. So this guy comes along, this person that you're supposed to despise, and all of a sudden he becomes the role model. Go figure. Surprise ending? Oh yeah. And Jesus is really good at that. He can get the attention of a crowd, and he can hold the attention of a crowd, and he can also deliver the mail when it comes time. This is really neat stuff. Are you, question, just stop with the discussion for a moment. Are you experiencing a Jesus that you didn't even know existed? Because I sure am. Every time I find this kind of stuff in the Bible, I'm realizing that I didn't know Jesus nearly as well as I thought I did. And the Jesus that I'm discovering is a Jesus that is absolutely amazing. Yes, he's Savior. Yes, he's Son of God. But he is an incredible mind. He is a teaching machine. He is a literary genius. This guy is unbelievable. And this is one of the reasons why you hear over and over in the New Testament and the people listen to him because he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes or lawyers. And he was living a life that backed it up as well. That's a one-two punch for you, right? where the, the, the verbal message and the message of the life are coinciding and complementing one another. This is the Jesus that we're talking about. And the more that I watch this guy, the more that I study his words, the greater and greater and greater appreciation that I have for him. He is one who is not just a great teacher and a great mind, a great intellect. He's an incredible communicator of truth incredible person. I'm willing to follow somebody like that. 
I'm willing, to, I'm willing to lay my life down, to give my life in the service of somebody like that. Now, somebody who is faking right and running left, somebody that's uh, trying to pull a quick one on you every chance that they can, I'm not interested in following somebody like that. We got plenty of cults of personality in our world, and especially in the Christian realm these days. Jesus is not cultivating a cult of personality. What he's doing is he's delivering the mail. He's simply expecting the people to step up to the plate and hit the ball, you know? The, 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 the ball's in their court. He's expecting them to hit it back. Respond appropriately. Submit to his lordship. O, o, be, walk in obedience to his ways and his words, which are one and the same. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And you shall love, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then, and you shall do love to the stranger like you would your very self. Powerful, powerful surprise ending. To quote the NASB, and the stranger, this is Leviticus 19.34, the stranger, the ger, who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you. Isn't that amazing? Treat that native, treat that stranger the same way you would a native-born person. And you shall love him as yourself. Direct quote. Why is that? You are aliens in the land of Egypt. You know what it's like to be marginalized. You know what it's like to be talked down to or looked down at. You know what it's like to be treated as less than. You are aliens in Egypt. Now, learn from that experience and never duplicate it to anyone else. Do you know the story of, of David and Bathsheba? You heard the story of David and Bathsheba where David was unfaithful with another man's wife? Okay, the backstory or the story that comes right after that is David's got to get rid of the evidence. So he calls the woman's husband home from the battle lines. He was out fighting David's battles. <clears throat> called him back home, tried to get him to go down to his own home and sleep with his wife so it would all be covered up and everything could be swept neatly under the rug. Oh, that's, that's his, his uh, child. She, she's pregnant from, from her husband. This is all totally acceptable and legitimate. <clears throat> the guy wouldn't do it. He said, I can't go down to my wife while you, the rest of your soldiers are out on the field of battle fighting your battles for you. So finally, David sent the guy back to his commander with a sealed command. It was his own death warrant. He says, look, I want you to put this guy, says to the commander, put this guy in the front line and then have everybody else retreat away from him. Put him really close to the city wall so that he gets killed, all right? Who does that sound like? That sounds exactly like the way that King Saul treated David himself. David should have learned that you treat the person, <coughs> you treat people better than that. And yet he didn't. And yet he didn't. You know what that guy's name was? His name was Uriah, but he's got a kind of a surname. Uriah the, the Hittite. That means he was not an Israelite. He had come in as an alien, a stranger, a non-native born, and connected to the people of the book, the people of God, the children of Israel, and had become one of them and is now fighting in the very army of the people of Israel. David did not treat the ger, the alien, the stranger, the non-native born, the way he would have wanted to be treated. Instead, he treated him like the Egyptians treated the Israelites. Just giving you another example, another illustration of how this has gone on in the Bible before. And Jesus is saying, empowered by God's Spirit, in obedience to God's Word, in submission to the mastery of me, Jesus says, here's the way that you're supposed to roll. This is the way that I expect my covenant community to act. 
Do you know what it's like to be an outsider? Have you ever been the one little slow kid or whatever that didn't get chosen for the team? Kickball, you know what I'm talking about, not varsity sports. When you're a little kid, kickball, stickball, whatever. Have you ever been kind of like not asked to go to a party, uh, to go to a, a get together? We're, uh, we're getting together after work and we're going to have some fun and you don't get selected because they don't, <clears throat> they don't want you around because you might spoil their fun. Have you ever felt like you were pushed to the sides, to the margins? You know what that feels like, right? All right? Don't do that to other people. Instead, love those people that are not like you in the same way that you would love yourself, the same way that you would express love to one who is native born, somebody in your immediate family, somebody just like you. How do we follow this in the words of Jesus? There are plenty of people out there right now that aren't like you. Maybe they're not of the same socioeconomic uh, level or same educational level as you. Maybe, maybe they don't dress quite as nice or even smell as nice as you. Maybe it's somebody who looks different from you or uh, speaks a different mother tongue and so speaks English with an accent. I assure you, when I'm speaking modern Hebrew in Israel, I know that they hear my Hebrew with an accent. Yeah? So it's all relative. Take you and put you down in Tanzania or in Guatemala and you're going to have an accent too. Hmm? So maybe it's just that maybe it's just that their English isn't quite as good. Maybe it's better and you just don't know it. You hear what I'm saying, don't you? Somebody out there is different than you are. I would, I would beg to suggest right now that there are people in this auditorium right now different from you that given your own set of personal preferences, the ones that we're born with, you'd prefer not to associate with them for whatever reason that might be. That's not the ethic of the kingdom though. The ethic of the, there's, it's a very simple thing. There are two things. Love God with everything inside of you and then love those created in his image with that same diligence and that same passion and that same willingness to give of yourself in the same way you'd be investing in yourself or somebody in your own family. That's the, that's the basic ethic of the kingdom. God and neighbor. God and other. And if they're different from us, Jesus doubles down on that and he says, even more so, all the more so, drill down on that, focus on that. That person is probably going to be ostracized by a bunch of other weirdos who have the same fallen attitude toward those not like them. His kingdom members are not like that. His kingdom members are more like him than they are the every other person around them. The folks that go along with the crowd. The people who take the easy route out and they marginalize somebody so that they themselves can be exalted. That is not Jesus' way. Because whoever exalts in this kingdom, whoever exalts himself is going to eventually be humbled. It's the one who humbles himself that's going to be exalted. It's the one who dies to self and gives to others. That's the one that, said, that Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little things. I'm going to put you over much. These are the principles, the ethics of Jesus' kingdom. This is the kind of king he is. These are the kind of soldiers that he's called to serve in his kingdom, in his army. Boy, it got real quiet. I'm not saying, I'm not selling snake oil here. I'm not saying this is easy. I am not saying, you know what, anybody can go out and do that. That's just like falling off a log. That's so simple. That's like slipping on, 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 on the ice. Anybody can do that. I'm not saying that. This is not normal for human behavior. Normal, fallen, sinful, in rebellion against God, human behavior is going to always look for an opportunity to stratify 
and make a, an arbitrary hierarchy and treat other people as less than so you feel better about yourself. That's the normal human behavior. But what Jesus has called us to is a renewed mind, a renewed heart, a changed attitude. Uh, he's calling on us to be like him. Now, whoops, because that just got really difficult. And like we talked about this morning, the bar is so high, I can't even see it from where I'm standing. Okay, got that. This is not what God is doing. He's not calling you to this high bar and saying, all right, now you jump over it. You get over it however you can. Just do your best. Just try your hardest and hope against hope that maybe you make the final cut. We talked about it this morning. What God calls us to, help me out, God will empower us to do. So it's not by might. It's not by power. It is by his spirit, saith the Lord. It's not about us just, you know, being really cool people, you know. Yeah, I'm just sort of awesome in this place, right? It's not that. It is, God, I hear your call. I see your standards. I recognize that in me, Paul, I'm quoting Paul here, dwells no good thing. Now, will you just take this receptacle and pour your power into me? and divinely enable me to do what I cannot do, I cannot get done on my own. And you know what God says? And he'll say this every time. You better believe it. Oh yes, and then some. He's so ready, so willing, so able to pour out his power into and through us. And then we have this experience just like Paul tells tells about in Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ. Some of you know this passage. You can quote it with me if you want to, word for word. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and yet not I, but Christ living in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's not about us getting it done and with our own creativity and best wishes and New Year's resolutions and all of that stuff. It's about God living his resurrection life through us and accomplishing through us what we and our own dead and sinful flesh could never do on our own. And then when it's all said and done, the neighbor is loved, God is glorified and he draws all men unto him because we're not rolling like everybody else. We're different than other communities. We're not that country club crowd that decides who gets in and who doesn't. We are loving our neighbor as in the same way we love ourselves, empowered by his spirit. I'm done. God bless you, New Hope. Love you guys. Can't wait to come back and visit with you again.